All right, everyone. Hi, I'm Jeremiah Lee, and I'm currently a product manager at Spotify on the SDK team. But today I'm actually gonna be talking with you about my previous job at Fitbit, where I led its web API development for four years. Now you're lucky I only have 20 minutes because usually when I do a talk about Fitbit, I make everyone get up and do three minutes of exercise. But again, 20 minutes, so we'll get started. This is a talk about the JSONAPI.org specification, but I'm not going to read the specification to you, or, and I'm not going to lead a tutorial on it today. So if you're unfamiliar with the spec, that's totally okay. I, I really hope that you stay for this tutorial and learn more about it afterwards. I hope that my talk convinces you to learn more about it, because ultimately, I hope to convince you that the JSONAPI.org specification should be your default style when designing web APIs. It won't be the best for every single situation, but I think it's a really great default starting point. And to do that, I'm going to talk about the web API problems that Fitbit had and how and why the JSONAPI.org specification features helped. I've consulted with many companies uh, with their web API designs, and I've seen a lot of common patterns emerge. So while I'm using Fitbit as an example today, I hope that the problems will feel, fam feel familiar with to you. Before I get started, I need to make a disclaimer. Again, I no longer work at Fitbit, so some of this information is aspirational. I helped get it going at Fitbit, but I don't know the current state of it uh, because in April I moved to Sweden for my husband's work. And as far as I know, none of Fitbit's JSONAPI.org specification-based endpoints have been released on its public API yet. But let's get started. For those of you who are not familiar with Fitbit, uh, Fitbit is a digital health and wellness company. It pioneered the activity tracker and wearable space. There are thousands of apps using its API. Hundreds of them are meaningfully activated. They make over 4 billion requests a day, and about a quarter of those are from third-party applications. And the web API is really important uh, to Fitbit because it accounts for tens of millions of dollars in annual revenue. So let's talk about the problems that all of these great uh, clients using the Fitbit API have. Well, the first problem was that clients had a very different perspective on how they wanted to retrieve data from the server. Now, Fitbit, it has four major clients, Android, iOS, Windows, and web. And Fitbit organizes its engineering teams into what it calls a full stack uh, feature team. So this is a team that has a product manager, UX, designer, Android engineer, iOS engineer, web engineer, backend engineers. And they're responsible for an entire feature area like exercise logging. But they have everyone that they need on that team to add those features. And when new features would go to be implemented, they'd start with one platform first to prototype and figure out that feature. And it was usually based on just engineering availability. But once those experiments were solidified, the other platforms would fast follow in their implementations. And this worked pretty well. But we did have one problem. And it was that Android and iOS developers had very different ideas about what a good web API should look like. The iOS developers, they preferred fewer network requests, and they didn't have any problems parsing large API responses. Whereas the Android developers, they preferred smaller API responses, and they accepted the trade-off that they would need to make more network requests. Well, there's really no way to reconcile this. These are just two completely different uh, set of constraints that they want to impose. The second problem was that without clear guidance, the data, mess the data models got really messy. And because of the large amount of data that's available, the API started to resemble view models instead of well-defined, normalized data models. The teams, they were regularly overloading existing endpoints. And the data it was just loosely related instead of well-scoped. And sometimes they wouldn't even split data across another endpoint unless there was a new view added. And that's how the server engineers could justify another API request to the client. Well, this could be fine, uh, except the experience in the client, uh, it evolved over time. And what data was needed for each view changed. So the data just seemed to be arbitrarily split. There was no librarian keeping this data organized. The third problem was a misalignment between client and server data models, because the clients just didn't think about data in the same way. <laughs> 
And this was partly complicated because data at Fitbit is complicated. Fitbit has a lot of different ways that you can express the exact same type of data. For example, you could have summaries, collections of logs, and time series. And clients, they would often pick different expressions of that data, even though they were implementing the exact same end user experience. They would go through those API responses and they would pluck the data that they wanted, and then they would sort in their own client data models. And again, even though they were making the same end user experience, every client had their own data model of what that data should look like. The fourth problem was sync. Clients needed to stay in sync, and they had a lot of difficulty doing so. So a Fitbit device, like this one, it, it syncs every 15 minutes with the server. So you can regularly predict when there's going to be new information. But many Fitbit users, they would use the Fitbit app on multiple platforms. And so if I add an exercise log through my phone, it should show up on my Android tablet relatively quickly. A lot of other Fitbit users use third-party applications, and those applications would modify data. So if a third-party app modified data on the server, it needed to get reflected onto the apps quite quickly. So again, here are the top four problems that uh, clients had with the web API. So how might we solve these particular problems? What might the requirements look like? Well, first, we need to settle the debate between the number of requests versus the request size. And we need to have an agreement on the data models and how that data fits together. We need an agreement on how to handle data between the client and server. And we need a common approach to selectively retrieving parts of data and its related data. And we need the ability to check if data has changed with as little overhead as possible. So let's talk about that first one. The hypermedia proponents, they burned a lot of credibility fetishizing REST instead of focusing on the problems that client developers actually had. So this made my discussions with Fitbit's uh, client teams about API style quite difficult. And I can understand that. Because when suboptimal networks have a significant impact on the perceived and actual performance, it's reasonable for clients to not want to have more interactions with the network. It makes sense. Too many web APIs have been designed with the assumption that clients are high-end servers with perfect network connections, but that's just not the world that mobile client developers live in. And in Fitbit's case, the vast majority of web API requests were made by smartphones on hostile cellular data networks. So when the tensions are high, we need to bring data to an argument. We agreed that betting on the future was a reasonable thing to do. And we agreed that network performance was something that was getting better at a reasonable enough pace to make short-term trade-offs in order to take advantage of new advancements as soon as they became available on the server and client platforms. So we had three hypotheses that we wanted to test. The first was that HTTP2 would, be meaningf would meaningfully reduce the overhead of multiple requests and specifically, we were looking at the binary and compressed headers with HPAC to significantly reduce the overhead of sub multiple API requests. And we hope that the pipelining features would make handling multiple concurrent requests easier on the clients because they wouldn't need to manage connection pooling. We we're also looking to TLS 1.3. We wanted to see if it would meaningfully reduce latency introduced by HTTPS because it reduces the initial handshake in half from two to one round trip. And then once that happens, the pre-share key sessions uh, resumption and zero round trip resumptions make subsequent secure connections significantly fast to faster to establish if they get interrupted. It might not sound like a lot, but if you're a user in Australia and you're communicating with Fitbit's data centers in Texas, this is actually noticeable inside of the app. The third hypothesis was that LTE network coverage would expand. And it's not only about getting that faster connection, but also a more resilient connection that you get from moving from a switch to a packet-based network. So we tested these assumptions, and I wish that I could share the data with you from those, uh, but the truth is you can find more rigorous testing around all three of these. Uh, and we came to believe that all of these were true. And this was important because it allowed us to re come to an agreement that small resources and a lot of HTTP requests can be okay. If the responses were small, a hit for retrying requests was lower. And the faster the response completed, there was less exposure to the response being interrupted and having to restart over.
So once we removed our fear of small requests, we could work on an agreement to define a common data model for resources. So we set out to try to normalize data just like you might do for a database. And we accepted that there would still be multiple expressions of data, again, those time series and summaries and logs, but that data should be canonical and it shouldn't be repeated across endpoints. And in doing this, we immediately realized that we need to define relationships between data, or if you really prefer buzzwords, a graph. Because uh, we all know that a graph is just a relationship between data and giving that relationship a name. And this is the first thing time I'm going to actually bring up the JSONAPI.org specification in this talk, because it sets explicit ex expectations on how to define and name relationships between data. So uh, here is an example. Uh, it's a response for a social feed post. Uh, most of the content, it's in the attributes. And there's also relationships defined, such as for the users. So after fetching uh, the newsfeed post, the client could then fetch the user information since it is a distinct type of data. Now going back to the client use case, it's reasonable to assume that there would be situations where the client would need a resource and its related resources in, at the same time. And while a client could get the initial resource with the defined relationship and then go fetch the linked resource, that puts a lot of work on the client. And it's a lot of work on the client to get the result, uh, parse it, pull out the relationship URL, request it, and maybe have to do that multiple times. So the JSONAPI.org specification has a way of dealing with this use case as well. And it's called Compound Documents. It allows the client to include specific resources in the initial request uh, to avoid having a chain request together. And it works simply by adding the include URI parameter to, uh, for the relationship. Just pops right in like that. But now we're back to that other problem, which was the problem of having potentially large API responses. In the case of an exercise summary, there is a lot of data that could potentially be just in that summary. And I've actually pruned some of the data just to get it to fit within two columns on the screen. But once again, JSONAPI.org has a solution for this particular problem, and it's called sparse field sets. So this is a standardized way of allowing clients to specify only the properties that they want of an object to be returned in response. You add a field URI parameter with the resource type and the field names that you want. And sparse field sets, they're great because they also work with dealing with compound documents. So simply including the relationship and its resource type and the fields you desire uh, would get you just the fields from that particular relationship. So one of the things that I think is so powerful about the JSONAPI.org specification is how optional it is. Its default behavior is pretty much the same as any old JSON REST-like web API. Hopefully it's a bit more intentionally designed with its data mapping and relationships, but none of the features have to be used. They're optional. So as soon as clients want to be able to optimize, they can. I think that's quite nice. And one of the challenges is not just getting clients to agree to common data models, but getting them to agree on a common way of retrieving, storing, and presenting this data. Now this part, it's not related at all to the JSON API spec, but I think it's important because it shows how clients can leverage features within the API to improve the perceived and actual performance on the, of the end user experience. So here is a data lifecycle uh, for how clients might choose to implement. Uh, this first example is for fresh data. The view is going to uh, request data from the client local database, and the database won't have it. So it's going to go out to the web API. It's going to be a cache miss because it hasn't ever retrieved it. The database is then going to save the response from the server, uh, and this will cause the view to render. Pretty straightforward on that one. Now, if the data did already exist in the database, the database could immediately return that data to the view. But it could also simultaneously ask the web API if the data is stale. And if the data hasn't changed, well, then nothing happens. But we know that we're in sync at that point. But if the data is stale, as soon as the uh, header response gets returned with uh, 200 instead of a 304 not modified, we can trigger the view to say, hey, uh, you need to go into an updating state because uh, new stuff is going to be coming down soon. And then when the rest of the body of the response is received, we can then follow that same pattern of updating the data in the database and then updating the view with the most recent content. 
This helps the perceived speed of the application. A key detail in uh, the database is that the data model is being shared between the client and the API. It's key value driven with collections based on the data type with the relationships and the metadata stored. We also put some flags in there to know if it was a partial request or if it hadn't yet synced, if it's data that's being created on the client and needs to be sent to the server. So this allows apps to more easily stay in sync with the server and to operate reasonably well. So this resolves number three, which leads me to the requirement of caching. Well-defined normalized resources have the additional benefit that they improve cacheability. Because if data changes affect fewer resources, well, then there are fewer resources invalidated when data changes. Changes it just makes sense. Because all the clients are now accessing data in the same way, we don't need to put data in multiple places. Caching is a feature that's built into HTTP, and using API leverages this functionality, but does require a bit of a shift in thinking. So if we were to go fetch an image from a server, we would get that resource and we get the e tag and the response. If we go fetch that image again, uh, passing the e tag back to the server, we would get a not modified. So nothing special about that. Uh, but with JSON API, uh, the e tag is not returned in the header uh, because this information is returned in the meta object instead. And this is because the e-tag does not represent the exact bytes of the resource response. Instead, the e-tag represents the version of the resource or the relationship. So a request might have features like sparse field sets or it might be a compound document. So the e-tag is not for that specific response, but for the state of the resource returned. And you still pass it in the if none match header on request, uh, like you would for an image. And if it hasn't changed, you get a not modified back. So let's put it all together. What does this actually look like in practice? Uh, the Fitbit newsfeed is a great example of data with mixed caching scenarios. Most of this data, it's ephemeral because they're newsfeed stories, and people are unlikely to see the same content more than once because the content is always changing. However, the stories do have related content that is likely to be cached and repeatedly accessed, and that would be the story creators, all of your friends. So if there are 20 newsfeed stories created by 15 friends, that means the client can save downloading five friends' uh, basic profile data multiple times. And if the user has viewed their friend leaderboard prior to accessing the newsfeed, the app already has all of your friends' basic profile data, so it wouldn't need to download any of that at all. And this is a really nice performance benefit of having normalized data with defined relationships, because it really starts to add up across the multiple experiences inside of an application. Now, you might be thinking, why didn't you just use GraphQL? Because that's the hotness. Um, well, GraphQL, can, you can get a lot of the same features from GraphQL uh, just by using the JSONAPI.org spec. And you can get those without requiring developers to have to brace another tool chain. Sparse field sets and compound documents provide the main performance benefits that people like in GraphQL. But unlike JSON API, GraphQL does not leverage the built-in caching features of HTTP because it's protocol agnostic. It also does not have a suggested common approach to caching, so every GraphQL API that a developer uses is going to have to handle that differently. I personally believe that caching is too important of a client performance consideration to be an afterthought. Another common use case not addressed by GraphQL is pagination. I didn't talk about collection access with JSON API, but pagination is part of it. You get next and previous links, and those are provided to the clients, and the client simply requests them. And this allows the server to specify a pagination strategy, as this is one of the few areas where the database implementation details are difficult to hide. The pagination in GraphQL is done by the client. And this is really unfortunate because it makes it very easy for clients to make very expensive database queries. For example, when paginating with an offset, uh, the database still has to get all of the information and then apply the offset. So as the offset grows, the request becomes more expensive unless you do countermeasures. So I won't get into the details of using cursor-based strategies for pagination, but I do believe that this is not something that clients should have to worry about. And I think it's too important of a use case and too common of one to be an afterthought. Lastly, I believe that there's an inherent advantage to clients and servers sharing a common data interface as much as possible. Reflective input and output makes composing create and update statements from the client much easier because the data model is already shared. It also enables you to use things like JSON patch for incremental updates.
So in conclusion, I hope that I've convinced you to at least consider JSON API for your next web API. I do think GraphQL is an advancement in API design, but I think the JSON API.org specification addresses the concerns of client developers much better. And I hope I've convinced you that making suboptimal networks less painful for client developers is absolutely something that API design styles can help with. And I hope I've convinced you that designing data models with intent and study of client needs is not a step that can be skipped. Just because clients have control of the data that they retrieve does not mean that API design on the back end does not need to happen. So that's it. There are a whole bunch of other features uh, that I didn't get to include in this talk. There's really great tooling available for major app, uh, every major app platform and framework. The best part, it's completely optional. It's only if uh, you want to adopt it. Uh, but please go check out jasonapi.org and don't hesitate to reach out to me on Twitter if you have questions or you create something cool with it. Thanks so much. All right.